Welcome to Cheers. I'm your host, Avery Woods. Hi, guys. Welcome back to the Cheers podcast. I'm your host, Avery Woods. We are back with part two of our Q&A. Part one was a saucy one. And part two, I have thousands, thousands of questions from you guys. And we actually got some really good ones. Scott and I were going through them. And I was like, I love these questions. Haven't really been asked about them before. And some of them I feel like I could talk more about than others, but not long enough for their own individual episodes because it would be like 15 minutes and that would just be a waste. So we're going to go through them. These are the ones that were asked multiple times, uh, so they're obviously the ones that you guys want to hear, so let's get to it. I'm excited. I'm going to get this one over with because this is not something I've ever chosen to talk about for a reason. I don't like to talk about hate or certain things that I'm hated for or canceled for or read it because it brings more attention to those things, and I I've said it before. I'll say it again. Anyone that's on my Reddit is no supporter of me. I feel very lucky that I've had the self-control to never once ever gone on my own Reddit or snark page. I know it exists because I currently have an entire team of lawyers taking it down. They have one more strike and it will be eliminated forever. Uh, because they've done so many horrible illegal things as well as made up so many lies about my family which now I get to sue people for defamation of character which is just so fucking crazy you know what's wild I haven't even gotten to a question I'm just on a reddit rampage here's my thing is I know so many people that have paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to get their reddit removed for a reason because anybody that hates you can go on someone's reddit or snark say literally anything they want about you and everyone that hates you will believe it. Where there's no proof of anything, you completely made it up. Just because you solely hate a human that you've never met. Imagine that. Imagine watching someone and every move that they do on every social media platform, it's giving obsessed and then going on a hate page and venting your feelings about that person when you've never met them. It's so sad to me and it's so sad that so many people participate in that. I think Reddit is the nastiest fucking place on this earth. Um, And I can say that because I've never been on my page, but because of us having to take legal action for certain things, I've seen what people have said. I've seen them leak the layout of my home, say what windows my children's bedroom are in so they can come murder my children. Those kind of things cross a line. It also crosses a line when you make up horrible rumors about our family, our marriage, my husband discrediting his entire career, saying he got fired, LOL, that man's been never been in trouble in his life. They begged him to stay at the police department. I hope you are all aware of that because, again, all of my haters still watch all of my shit, so they'll sit through an entire hour YouTube video, take clips of things that I say, and take it out of context. It's really fucking wild to me. So I don't like talking about hate, especially on TikTok or Instagram, because it brings more attention to it. Now, with that being said, I did not have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to get my Reddit removed because all the moderators and people that participated in my Reddit did it themselves via copyright, legal issues, sharing minor things, um, sharing just so many insane lies that were proven untrue that now my page is going to be taken down, which thank God for that. And Reddit is already flagged to eliminate all of the backup accounts as well as Google to eliminate any searches for my snark or Reddit. So thank God for that. Any whoses, where I'm going with this is someone asked about the boy mom video. And uh, that's just something that I never wanted to talk about, but I will talk about it on the podcast because I feel like it's a safe space and it's also been so long that I feel comfortable enough talking about it. Now, what's so weird to me 
is that boy mom video was up for a while before it ever started getting traction. I think it was like two weeks or something, right, Scott? I think it was up for like two weeks. Scott was sitting next to me in my car when I made that video. And I, first of all, if you, if you are a parent of more than one child, you know it's impossible to love one child more than the other. I will never in my life love one of my children more than the other. It would never be possible. Now, what's crazy to me is that the first person that decided to stitch the video cut it to like four seconds of I think almost a two minute video and stitch the video talking shit about me which is fine because I actually laugh and, and was talking to my friends about it and I'm like the the people that try to gain a social media platform by bullying a creator is what really gets me is you know that's going to go viral you know it's going to get a lot of attention and you want that for your platform by dragging me down and having me get death threats to my family that's what's so sad about it and those people will never ever be successful brands will never want to work with them they're not going to sign to a good talent agency you are getting a reputation as a public bully you're not going to be successful on social media so stop trying which is why I don't like to talk about hate on platforms like TikTok and Instagram because I'm not going to focus on that. I want to spread good and I'm going to ignore people that don't like me for whatever reason that they made up in their head. Now, for the video about my son, it's actually comical to me because when I did Stevie vlogs, it was, I feel so bad for Ziggy. Ziggy's the left out child. He's never in any of these videos. Oh, poor Ziggy. No one loves Ziggy as much as Stevie. When I cut Stevie's bangs and I'm holding Stevie and I surprise David by opening the front door and David reacts to Stevie's bangs and he's like, oh my God, like freaking out. Like, oh my God, you cut her bangs. Like he's in shock. And Ziggy had to ask two times like, daddy, daddy, pick me up, pick me up. Oh, poor Ziggy. He's the forgotten child. We feel so bad for Ziggy. No one loves Ziggy as much as Stevie. Oh, but the tables turned when I made a video saying that oh, I love my daughter and we're so close, but the love I have for my son, that was taken out of context of, oh, I love my son more than my daughter because I said the type of love that a, a, a mom shares with their son is a different type of love. Does that mean it's more than my daughter? Absolutely fucking lutely not because my bond and my love with Stevie is far different than my love and my bond with my son. That doesn't mean I love one more than the other. It has nothing to do with it. People just like to take what I said out of context because they were mad for whatever fucking reason about the video. But then six months ago, you were bitching in my comments that Ziggy wasn't the one that's loved because he was in school five days a week. So it was literally me and Stevie Monday through Friday uh, from 8 a.m. until 3.15 p.m. It was just us two. That's why she was in the majority of my videos. And that's also why I've continually stopped making Stevie vlogs is because of the child exploitation bullshit and the you don't love Ziggy, you only love Stevie because she's in the Stevie vlogs. So I just think it's bullshit. I don't think it was ever anything I needed to come out publicly and apologize for because I'm his fucking mom. And if one day he brings that video to me and asks me questions, I would look at him and I would say, do you really think I love you less than CV? And I know for a fact he would say no because I'm the one that raised him and it's my relationship with him. So it's it's. All I care about is how my husband, my family, my children view me, how how much they know that I love them both the same, all four of my kids for that matter, and how people in my personal life view me and how they know the type of mom and parent I am, which is why it was so insane for everyone in my personal life to see these videos blow up and people want tr traction and attention for mom shaming me when they know the type of present parent I am to both of my children. So it was just fucking wild and it was so nasty. The things that people said about me and the threats I received, it was just sickening and it really just shows it doesn't matter what you say, but people will always take everything out of context and they will look for any little thing that you say to take it and run with it because they just don't like you because they don't 
they don't know you. No one on the internet truly knows who you are as a human being. They just know what we allow them to know. And again, do you really think if I loved my son more than my daughter that I would make that video and post it publicly? Are you shitting me? I try to avoid at all costs getting any sort of negative attention because people are so wild on social media. I would have ne never made the video. I was just excited about his preschool photos because I thought they were so fucking cute because I'm a parent. Get over it. Anyways, first 10 minutes was an absolute rant. So we're going to get off the soapbox and answer some questions. I just want to get that one out of the way because I just was like, you know what? We need to rip the bandaid off and talk about it but I'm done with the fucking questions and accusations. I must have gotten a million Pilates questions and I got people asking for a whole episode about it. I honestly don't think I could talk for a whole episode about it, but I will go through everything. So people ask about my Pilates journey, results that I've seen, what it is, that kind of thing. So I'm not a Pilates instructor by any means. So I'm not going to be able to explain this the best or most educated. I'll just kind of share my fitness journey in general as well as how I discovered Pilates. So I've always been very athletic. I started playing volleyball at 10 years old. I played soccer since I was five. So from five to 10, I played soccer from 10 up until through high school. I played volleyball. I was always in some sort of sport. My sister was also very active. Um, my dad is very athletic and he, he's 69 and still runs like 10 miles a day. It's nuts. So we were always just up and moving all the time. I am a curvy girl. That's very known. I'm not saying that I'm by any means overweight or anything, but I was just never the skinny girl. I never um, was a size 25 jean. I I mean, I've told you guys, but I would wear like three sports bras in the fifth grade to try to smash my boobs down to look flat chested because I had massive boobs before anyone else. And I didn't start my period till I was in eighth grade at 14. So I just was busty really young and had thick thighs and a big butt. And so I always needed to stay athletic or else I gained a lot of weight really fast. I don't have the best genes when it comes to metabolism and that's Okay. Um, my husband, however, literally the most annoying thing ever, that man doesn't have to work out or, and he eats like a fucking toddler and he literally is a six pack. Like what the hell? Anywho says, um, I, when I was in nursing school, cause I had stopped playing volleyball and then I went to college and was in nursing school. And that's when I found orange theory and I loved orange theory for, I think I did orange theory for like four years. It was a long time. And it's, if you don't know what Orange Theory is, it's high intensity interval training workouts. So you have a rower, a treadmill, and then like a weight training station. And for the whole hour workout, you're just like high heart rate kind of going the whole time. You wear a heart rate monitor, which is shown on a TV with everyone in your class. So it's kind of like a competition, which I love that. Uh, and I loved it for a long time, but I kind of... I even was doing it postpartum with Ziggy, but I kind of realized that I hated going. <laughs> I really like didn't look forward to going and I felt good after, but I was so depleted. I just felt exhausted and I I never like truly look, looked forward to it as something for myself. And I kind of realized like something's not right here. So then after I left Orange, it's also super expensive. So that was the other thing is I, I'm not, I'll, I'll pay, I'll invest in my fitness journey and my health journey if I enjoy it. And if it's something that I look forward to, if I'm dreading it, I'm not paying that much money to do something I hate doing. Like what the fuck? No, a health and wellness journey should be something that you enjoy. And it's hard at first, but then you get into routine and it's something you look forward to. And that's how I feel about Pilates. So I, was postpartum with Stevie and my friend Abby, who I worked with in the picky with for years, was like, I've been doing Pilates and I love it so much. And I was like, what the fuck is Pilates? Like I knew that the Kardashians did the Pilates, did the Pilates. I knew the Kardashians did Pilates, but I also knew that they had like a Pilates studio that was private in their home. And it looked like a fucking a contraption. I don't know. It's, it's, I do reform Pilates. So it's a springboard 
It's like two really long kind of metal poles and there's a padded board in the middle that's on weighted springs and each color spring is a different weight and it glides back and forth and you have loops where you can pull yourself up on the springboard with the different weighted springs and you it's basically a core workout the entire time so sure you work out systemically where you're doing arms and legs and abs but the whole time your core is engaged because you're on this springboard that kind of rolls back and forth and if your abs aren't engaged you're not going to maintain your balance basically so my friend Abby was like, you should try it because I had no abdominal strength after my second C-section. Like I was so just like soft and mushy and everything hurt when it came to an ab- abdominal exercise. I was trying to go back to the gym and I was kind of working on my own. And one thing about me, I'm not going to do shit if I'm working on my own. Okay. I need someone to tell me what to do. I need to be instructed and held accountable because I won't. I will literally lay there on the mat doing abs and be on my phone for 45 minutes not doing anything, just sitting at the gym. So it's just a waste. So I went with my friend Abby and what was crazy is I remember telling her, I was like, wow, like that was a really great workout and it like really burned. I wasn't super out of breath. I wasn't super duper sweaty And I always used to say like, I have the type of metabolism and body where if I'm not dripping in sweat and my heart rate isn't super high, then I'm not going to see a change. I'm not going to lose any weight. That is false, Avery. Hey, past Avery, you were wrong. Sorry to tell you. But I remember telling Abby, I was like, wow, I really enjoyed that class and it really burned. But like, I don't know if this is the workout for me because I don't think I'm going to see results. I wasn't, I didn't feel like depleted. I wasn't winded, nothing. And she was like, just wait, just wait. Sure as shit, the next day was the sorest I've ever been in my entire life. I woke up and I didn't even remember I did Pilates. I was like, why the fuck does my body hurt so bad? I was so confused. And then I was like, oh my God, it's from Pilates. So obviously it's doing something. So I started doing like a couple classes here and there. And then I ended up signing up for a full-time membership. And I'm so obsessed with it. I have never seen more results in my body and my life. Pilates is an incredible way to tone your body. It's an incredible way to gain strength you, I've seen the most difference in my body since I've started Pilates compared to anything I've ever done. I have trimmed fat. I don't own a scale. I never weigh myself. It's not good for my mental health. So I don't know about weight, but I've never felt more toned. I've, I've never seen more like muscle definition. And I've, the most important thing is I've never had more abdominal strength. I used to have to like burrito roll out of bed in the morning because my C-section was still so painful for me. And I had a lot of like nerve pain where if any C-section mom like will probably know what I'm talking about, but you get like this weird, like pinchy nerve pain that went away. I felt like my C-section shelf was finally shrinking. It's definitely still there, but like I feel like I could wear tighter fitting clothes and not be embarrassed without Spanx because my C-section shelf. Like, But the best part about it is I look forward to it every single day. Even on days that I'm like, oh, I don't want to get out of bed and do Pilates. I always look forward to it. I get up, I put on my cute little workout set. And this is so vain of me to say, but I like that I can do my skincare, put on a cute workout set, go to Pilates, and then I can go run errands or like drop Ziggy off at school or whatever the case may be. Because I'm not disgusting, like sweating my ass off, red in the face, so out of breath. And don't like, listen, there are days in Pilates, depending, like if we're doing a jump board or something, I will sweat my ass off. Okay. There are those days. But a lot of the days, it's just, it's all about slow movements with good form. Like you go, you do like six counts. So if you're watching on YouTube, if you're doing like a shoulder press, you have like, loops in your hands and you're going up super, super slow for six full counts. 
And then you have to resist all the way back down. So you're working two different muscles because you're resisting up and down. You're really focusing on that muscle and the Pilates shakes are very real. If you've seen that on TikTok or something, they're so funny. But like your leg is, your legs literally give out and you have what's called the Pilates shakes because you're working muscles that you've never worked before. And then I love at the end, you do a little cool down and like a stretch, but it almost is like a meditation. So it really clears my mind after my workout, lets me have a great start to the day. It's been incredible for my mental health. I just love it so much. I really feel like it's changed my life. And we're building a little in-home gym here. So I'm thinking about maybe like investing in my own little springboard. We'll see about that. But I just love it. I It's given me a completely different mindset on my physical health and fitness journey. And I'm just, I love it. I'm obsessed. I also love that the classes are really small and intimate. It is um, something that I'm getting used to of this job where I'm recognized in public and which I'm so grateful for. Like I love meeting you guys and giving hugs and stuff. But when I was at like a bigger public gym, when people would take pictures and videos of me as I'm working out, it just makes me really self-conscious and I have really bad social anxiety. So it's nice in a small, like intimate Pilates class where there's only like 10 girls and the the instructor and everyone's super nice. And there's, it's just a judgment-free zone, which I really love and appreciate. So that's my deal on Pilates. I've seen a major difference. The one thing about Pilates, which I will say that stops a lot of people from doing it, is it's very expensive. I'm not going to lie about that. Uh, for me, it's worth the money because I look forward to it. Like I'm saying, I will always invest in my physical fitness and health journey um, because I think that is something that you should invest in if you're able to. But the fact that I enjoy it and it helps clear my mind and it helps my mental health, that's why I love it so much. So um, I know my studio does like free trial classes. So if you have a studio nearby you, I highly recommend it. I've gotten so many of my friends hooked on Pilates and it just makes me so happy. I just love it. And also I love that it's like every age or shape, form of a body. I've seen men, I've seen women. There is a woman I work out with almost every day and she must be almost 80 years old. And she is up on that reformer doing shit. She looks amazing. I've seen girls in college. I've seen girls that are like 90 pounds and tiny or girls that are super fit or women that want to lose weight. And they've like expressed that to me and told me that they've, this is what started their fitness journey because they didn't want to do anything too high intensity and that they've seen insane results. So I promise no matter who you are, how old you are, what you look like, Pilates to me is for everyone and it's also very low impact and great for people that have joint problems. I have two torn rotator cuffs from volleyball, so that's awesome, but I'm still able to do it because I'm not doing anything so hardcore and intense. Also, the instructors will give you modification. So if you're not able to do something or a certain move because of an injury, they'll give you modification for it. Or if you're stronger and need something more intense, they also have something for you to do with that. So I could talk about Pilates all day, but I highly recommend you try it. I'm obsessed with Pilates. All my friends know I'm obsessed with Pilates. Scott can attest about Pilates every day. <laughs> and I just love it. Do you feel like you've seen a difference in my body? Yeah. That's David told me. He was like, you've never been in better shape now. Also, fun fact, which I don't know if it's related. I think it is. But like the last four summers, I've tried to wake surf and I couldn't get up on the board. I had like no upper body strength, no lower body strength. And this is when I was like, per, like actually consistently working out, but kind of doing my own thing. It's the way I got up first time this summer since doing a full year of Pilates. And I've been wake surfing like I've been doing it my whole life. And I swear it's because I have core strength now. So it really has improved all aspects of life. I am a professional surfer, if you didn't know. Uh, but yeah, all jokes aside, I love Pilates. I will stand by it forever. Um, and I think you should try it because it's amazing and I love it. Wait, I love this because I just told Scott this story yesterday. Embarrassing memories. Okay, I have one embarrassing story. Like, I'm sure I – God, there's so many embarrassing things I've done in my life. Are you kidding me? I have, like, ripped ass, like, in public on accident shit like that. But there is one story that not a lot of people know about me. But I cannot make – I wish it didn't happen – I told, I told Scott yesterday and I was like, have you heard this? And he's like, no. I was like, how the fuck have you not heard the story? So we all know I worked at Starbucks, even though Starbucks is getting canceled. I'm sorry, but I did work there before they got canceled. Okay. If that means anything. 
worked there for a long time, like five or six years, I think. And I, <laughs> I worked one, the, the second store I ever worked at was the store I met David at. And it was a cafe store, which is now closed now because it's all transactional and they want drive throughs bullshit, but it's a cafe store. So there's no drive through So you only have customers in your lobby. And I was a shift supervisor because I was a boss, you know, I was making like a shit ton of money, like $8 an hour. And I was on the front register and it was during the morning rush, like 7 a.m. when there's a line out the door because people are getting their coffee before work, right? So I'm on the register. And when you're on the front register, God, I have an itch in my nose. I swear I'm not picking my nose, but God damn. Sorry. Okay. So when you're on front register, you ring up customers. You also grab pastries. You'll turn around, put the pastries in the oven, grab the pastry, give it to the customer, and then they'll wait for their drink on the end, right? Well, I had a pee so fucking bad. No, I had a shit. I had a, I had a poop really bad. And, you know, sometimes it just like hits you, like your morning coffee hits you. And I was like, I'm going to have diarrhea. So I had someone watch the register for me, one of my employees, while I went to the bathroom and I was trying to be like, you know, I was trying to be efficient on time because I had a line of customers out the door. So I finished, wash my hands, walk out. And I continually ring up customers for like another 20 minutes, turn around, put their pastries in the oven, give it to them. Finally, my barista goes, Avery, you need to turn around, like look down on the ground. And I was like, what? I turn around. I shit you not. There was a piece of toilet paper stuck in my ass crack. I don't know how, but the entire roll was hanging out of my pants, dragging on the floor. So there was just a trail of an entire roll of toilet paper behind me, behind the counter. Everywhere I walked, it was just following me. It was so humiliating. My face was so red. I literally just went to the back room and watched the security cameras for everyone to leave the lobby that was in there at that time before I came out. So that's an embarrassing story. That's really funny. All right. I've been getting a lot of questions about nursing and like story times as a nurse. I... I was actually telling Scott because we picked up lunch for Ashley the, the other day. She was charge nurse over the weekend. And so sometimes I'll bring her lunch and I brought her some Jimmy John's and she works on the adult side of the hospital I used to work at. I worked on the pediatric side and Scott was like, do you miss it? And I was like, oh yeah, I miss it every day. And it's so interesting because I wouldn't change anything and I could never go back now, but I think it's just kind of like a morning where I, I, I mean, I told my dad I want to be a nurse when I was two years old. I was obsessed with ER shows and it's all I ever want to do. And I only ever want to do pediatrics. So when I got my job in PICU, it was really my dream job. And I felt so fulfilled by that job. I loved everyone I worked with. After the pandemic, a lot had changed. And then obviously you guys know why I left and they really had a vendetta against me because of my social media, which sucked. But uh, there's nothing I could do about it now, and I wouldn't change anything because I didn't. I know I didn't do anything wrong. I think that gives me closure. But it's hard when you mourn a career that you've always wanted, that you work, you've worked so hard for, and you left on terms that weren't your own. Like I obviously chose to leave, but I felt. I don't know if forced out's the right word, but I felt forced out on good terms. I didn't want to leave because I was fired because they didn't like my social media or I didn't want to leave because people kept putting targets on my back and I was forced to quit. I wanted to leave on my own terms and our staff had changed so much that the time just felt right, but I do miss it all the time and I miss using my skills and it's just a career I will always go above and beyond and support. I would love to have some sort of foundation for nurses and first responders. And it's just a career that's so underappreciated and undervalued and underpaid. Like Scott was asking me what I made as an ICU nurse and he's like, what the fuck? I was like, yeah, they are not paid as they should. And that was in the ICU. Like there's so many other nurses on med surge or outpatient that are making far less when they shouldn't be. So I, any story time I feel is hard because 
HIPAA is obviously a big thing. And I remember a lot of my patients' names and why they came in. But I mean, I have a lot of stories that I remember of, you know, certain kids and babies that came in that weren't supposed to survive and did. Those are always kids I'll never forget watching them walk out or being carried out. Um, just because you pour your heart and soul into those kids when they're dying and you see their families at such a vulnerable state. So seeing all that hard work pay off as a whole combined team, the nurses, the doctors, the RTs, the OTs, PTs, speech, everyone that helps. And it's such a family. And so to be able to see them walk out with their baby was just such, those are such magical moments. Um, I remember the first donation I ever had that was, that fucking rocked me. Uh, if you don't know what that is, it's when the patient is a donor patient. So the patient is pronounced brain dead, but their family chooses to donate viable organs to someone in in need or multiple people in need, which is such a beautiful thing, but it is such a hard decision to make for your loved one. Um, whether it's an adult or a pediatric patient for pediatrics, it's, I can't even say even more because it's such a difficult decision in general, but just for the parents already losing your baby and then knowing, you know, that they're going to be cut open and things taken out of them where they're not going to be whole again is so difficult. And so it was, it was really hard when people would be so judgmental to those parents for not donating when that is such an impossible decision to make. And when they did decide to, it was, you know, such a beautiful thing because so many people benefited from it. But the first time I ever had an organ donation, it was a patient that drowned. And um, there's a lot of strict protocols when it comes into organ donation. And I, I won't go into too much detail because we could be here all day. But the when the patient comes in, they have a heart rate. They're intubated. But then, you know, there comes a point where we're keeping them alive because the patient is brain dead. So they're on a ventilator. The ventilator's breathing breathing for them. We have neurologists that will come do what's called a brain death test to test if the patient is brain dead. And then they have to be accepted by the donor team. The donor team will come into the hospital and they will take over all care of the patient. So our doctors no longer took care. They didn't make the calls on that patient anymore. It's, it's now the donor's patient because they have to do everything right and perfect to be able to make sure that this child goes to the OR in order to donate these organs to whoever's receiving them. So what happens is we have to make sure that the patient is acceptable to donate their organs. So we draw tons of blood as a nurse. Like when your patient becomes a donor patient, it's usually a one-to-one because it takes so much work. You have to draw tons of blood. They'll do multiple tests Um, they will then find whoever is going to accept those organs. And then when the patient, when it's time for the patient to, by the way, this is hard for a lot of people to know that aren't in the medical field, but when the patient is pronounced brain dead, even though the patient is technically still breathing because they're on a ventilator, we do pronounce their death. So the doctor will pronounce that the patient is dead and it's really hard for the parents because the parents will see their child still breathing, but they're on a ventilator. So it's hard because when your brain is dead, nothing else can survive, you know? And so we would pronounce the child dead. And then when the donor tests were all done and the recipients were selected, then the patient has to pass in a certain amount of time in order for them to be able to donate their organs. So If that happens and all goes well, then the patient will go to the OR. We usually will do an honor walk while everyone, all the staff and whoever else family will line the hallways and will honor that patient for donating organs because it's such a special thing. And you go to the OR and the worst part is when the parents have to say bye to their baby. It's just so heartbreaking. Um because it's it's just 
the parents are never ready, you know, like you, when, when are you ever ready to say bye for the last time to your baby? And that's, those are the hardest moments I've ever seen, you know, are basically forcing the parents forcing themselves away from their child because they're never going to be ready. So it feels like you're ripping their baby from them and it's just horrible. And I, the first donation I ever had, I really wanted to be in the OR with that patient and I'll never forget their name. I'll never forget what happened to them. And it's a very, um, how do, how do I say this? It's a just a different type of feeling in that OR because the there's multiple people in the room and up on the helicopter pad is helicopters waiting to take those organs to fly to wherever that patient's going to receive it. And so there's multiple people in the OR waiting for whatever organ that they're going to take. So then there's, you know, the donor doc and what they'll do is when a patient donates, and in this case, this patient was a toddler and the parents will write a beautiful letter to the whole OR staff basically introducing the patient and who they were before they passed because when we get the patient they're in such critical condition we don't ever really get to know them or their personality you know so it's just a respect thing because you know that baby's giving life to someone else and we don't want to treat them as a body when they come in the OR And we want to respect the decision that the family's made. So the doctor will read while everyone kind of bows their heads and we get to learn about the patient and maybe like their favorite color or how they laughed or, you know, what their favorite things were to do. So we kind of like listen about the baby and then we'll, you know, say some nice things and then they'll do the operation and the surgery. So it's just such a... Just something that, you know, when I became a mom, it's it became so difficult for me to do that because I just could not imagine doing that to my child and that happening to me. And it's it's such a beautiful thing, but it's also so heartbreaking. And, you know, I, we did that a lot in the PICU because we got the sickest kids. And so it was just really hard. And I, I remember one time I had two donations, but two days in a row they were both high school kids and just unfortunately were at a party and didn't realize that their vape was laced with fentanyl and the kids at the party that happened a lot where kids at the party won't want to call 911 because of um they don't want to get in trouble and so when we would get them which was a lot this would happen a lot with like teenagers because we would get kids up to age 17 they no one would call the police because they didn't want to ever get in trouble so that the kid would be brain dead for too long and or i'm sorry the kid would not have oxygen for so long that they would come in basically brain dead so uh I had, I remember I worked like a Wednesday, Thursday, and I had one kid on Wednesday, and we ended up donating, and then the next day I had a kid on Thursday and ended up donating, and I would literally went home the whole weekend and wanted to do nothing. I was just so mentally and physically drained, Um, but yeah, those, I mean, those are stories that I'll always remember. I feel like in, there's always really good stories too of, you know, patients that you meet and kids that you think are going to be brain dead or they're going to have to donate their organs, but then you get to watch them walk out and it's amazing. Um, I also remember just like my super tragic stories of kids that would come in and it was just, just horrible things have happened to them. And it's so hard that you remember those more than the funnier happy moments, but they just are engraved in your brain forever. You'll never forget them. You'll never forget their name, what they look like, what happened to them. But 
Also in the PICU, it's hard because the kids are so sick that yes, you do have a lot of happy moments, but not a lot of them are like up walkie talkie. Obviously before they went to like a gen peds for, or if they were discharged or we had overflow or something, then maybe the kids were a little bit more cog. What am I trying to say? A little bit more aware. Um, but a lot of these kids were so sick where they were intubated and sedated and paralyzed. So I, I know it's like super dark and a lot of tragedy, but it was something that gave me so much fulfillment and I truly loved it. And it takes a special type of nurse to be a picky nurse. And a lot of picky nurses are lifers for that reason, because it just is such a difficult but rewarding job. And picky nurses are some of the smartest nurses I've ever known. I worked with so many incredible picky nurses that taught me so much. And it's just, I applaud. I applaud all nurses, but especially when it comes to like PICU, NICU, those are, those are really hard career. So thank you for all you do for my pick you Nikki nurses. God, I literally can't stop yapping. I've been at this for 45 minutes. Sorry. All right. Lots of people asking for our plans for Hawaii. Are we island hopping? What island are we going to? So we're going to Kauai. Uh, we've never been there before. I've been to Maui and I've been to Oahu. My sister, as you know, is in the Navy and she was stationed near Honolulu for a long time. So I went there to visit her. And then Dave and I went to Maui two years ago with Ashley and Jesse was so much fun. We just wanted something a little more rural. And I just want my kids to explore nature for the whole month. And I feel so lucky to be able to do that. And Dave and I got to a point where we were like, okay, you're a stay home dad. I work from home. Ziggy and Stevie do modified year round school. So they start school mid July. So we don't have a too long of a summer break. And it's so damn hot in Arizona we were kind of like, what could we do? And we were looking at month-long Airbnb rentals and we just kind of pulled the plug. And um, Dave and I had talked about it for a while and then David and Brady were golfing and David mentioned it to Brady and Brady was like, oh, I kind of want to do that too. So they ended up booking their house too. So it's going to be so much fun. I think the kids are going to have a blast. We're kind of looking at stuff to do. We have... Um, we got some recommendations of little camps for the kids. We're going to paddleboard. We're going to do some snorkeling. We got some local spots from some people that we know that are local that of like ponds that the kids can swim in with the fish. We just want to go on walks and be in nature and just kind of escape. I feel like sometimes I just need to get away and because I just feel like stuck in my own bubble because I work online and you know people have opinions and I just I don't know I just sometimes my anxiety clears when I get out of my like normal space and so I just want to be out with my kids outside I'm not going to take a break or anything from social media but I might like take a step back a little bit maybe only post like once a day instead of three times a day we'll see but I'm just so excited and I'm not even really like super stressed about packing or anything because like we're in Hawaii. I'm just going to wear a lot of bathing suits and oversized t-shirts and Crocs and be in the ocean and be one with nature and just ground myself and have my babies and my husband with me. And I'm so excited. Your views on gay rights, LGBTQ+. We love you, BTW with a rainbow emoji. I'm sorry. How do you not know I'm obsessed with my gaze? Like, this is my whole personality. I I mean, how would you just... I mean, Scott, why don't you come over here? What are my rights? My Sorry. What are my views on gay rights? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's just, it's not even like a, like a thing for yeah, you. Yeah, I'm, like, like, I'm like, what are you, what are you thinking about it it's, for? There's nothing to even think about. You're just the most inclusive person for everybody, whether their color, race, sex, doesn't matter. Like, you're just the most inclusive person in general. Why judge? 100%. Like, I'm not one to fucking judge. Are you kidding me? Love is love. I don't give a fuck what anyone thinks about it. And if you think otherwise, I would love to sit down and have a conversation with you face to face. You probably won't though, right? Yeah, I probably won't. I just don't understand. And even David, who grew up super religious and like was raised, you are, they are very anti-gay. 
His father was a pastor. I mean, even Scott, who came from a very Mormon family, if you listen to his episode, and David is like the most inclusive person ever. He's like, I just don't understand. It was it was such a, you're told to believe this. And he's like, it wasn't until I started meeting people like Scotty or like some of our other friends that it's, who are we to judge them? They're the, they're the best people in the world. And because of who they love, I'm not going to, you think I'm going to fucking judge you for that? Absolutely not. Everyone deserves the same love, the same treatment. And if people think otherwise, it's going to be an issue. Scott can attest I've almost gotten in multiple fights because people look at him a certain way or say shit and I will literally end them. One last thing I'll say before I go sit back down is a good way you can see people who are true allies, especially who are parents, is how their kids talk to you. And Avery's kids are also in the exact same position as far as love and acceptance. Mm-hmm. It's, sec- it's, not, it's, it's just second nature for them. They just are the exact same way. So that's how you can tell people yeah. who are truly, yeah. truly involved in an actual allies. Yeah. I'll say. And it's funny to me because people are so weird about Ziggy wearing a dress. And it's the same thing. Who am I to tell my son at five years old when he says, I want to wear a pretty dress like sissy? Who am I to say, no, you can't wear a dress because they're for girls? What the fuck? No. it li- That's like saying, I can't wear Bermuda shorts and a tank top because that's for men. I can't wear a baseball cap because that's for men. No. What the fuck? My son's been painting his nails since he was 18 months old. You think I care? He doesn't give a shit. It's literally rainbow colors on his fingers. He's five. It excites him. Like, I we even told him, like, do you want to dress up like a prince? No, I want a sparkle gold yellow dress. And I said, Slay, you will be Belle then. Like, people need to get their panties out of a fucking wad and realize it has nothing to do with my child's sexuality or me trying to make him gay. It simply makes him happy. So build a fucking bridge and walk right on over it. This is so cute. Give us a story time about your most proud moments as a parent. I, oh my gosh, I have so many. And some that like right off the top of my head are when Ziggy's preschool teacher from last year sent me a photo from this year of Ziggy holding the door open for every student to walk in back in class after recess because he always holds the door open for me. Like David's taught him that since the beginning. So I love that he did it for all of his classmates. I love that he fills up people's cups and compliments and both my kids are so amazing about that. That's probably what makes me the proudest is Ziggy will tell our nanny like, Bianca, you look so beautiful when she's doing her makeup or her hair. Or I'll come down in a dress for date night and and Stevie will be like, Mommy, that's such a pretty dress. Or they'll tell Doggy, which is Scotty, Doggy, I love your shirt or I love your hat. Or what did they say that was so cute the other day? What did Ziggy say to you? Oh, yeah, you're my best friend ever. And like Stevie last night, she gives me, she goes, give me a hug and a kiss. Night, night. I love you. I love you to the earth and you're my best friend in the whole world like come on what the fuck that's so cute it's cute as shit oh it just kills me also ziggy graduating preschool just recently shattered me so sweet i'm so proud of him the fact he's going to kindergarten fucking blows my mind stevie starts preschool this year too so that's also crazy every stage is like something new but i just love that my kids fill up people's cups especially when they know that you need it and they don't judge other people. And if if they are ever curious, they'll ask questions and then I answer the question and then they know they never ask about it again. So slay. Biggest shock of becoming a creator, something you didn't expect, good or bad. Well, I would say the mental toll it takes and I think that was a shock for me because I've been doing social media for so long, but it wasn't until I reached a certain platform. No, not platform. Until I reached a certain amount of followers that I realized it didn't matter what I do. It's impossible to make everyone happy. And that was really hard for me to understand. I'm very much, I want to please everyone. But I also am really tough. Like I'm a tough bitch. I can take hard conversations and constructive criticism and bullies because I know 
it's more of a reflection of them than it is for me. But I think it was more of a shock of how much it did start to affect me with what people were doing. But I've gotten past that place and I feel, you know, grateful to have escaped it because I can't obsess on everyone's opinions or else I'll never satisfy, I'll, I'll never ever satisfy anyone. And it's only going to bring me down in my career. I just have to keep going on my plateau. And if they want to fucking make fun of me or say nasty things about me on my way up, then that's fine. I think it was just more so because I'm so tough. I didn't realize how much it would affect me, but I've moved on past that and I've been able to now find healthy co- healthy coping mechanisms of how to ignore the hate and just keep doing me because it doesn't matter what I do. I'll never please anybody and the haters will still get mad no matter what. So I just have to ignore that and keep on my upward trajectory and they can sit in their sadness. I don't really know what to say, but I think that was the biggest like wake up call to me of like, holy shit, people are fucking nasty. Cause I mean, when I was a smaller creator, I would get like one, one nasty DM like every six months. And I was like, damn, that girl had a bad day, but like, fuck her. Cause all my other DMs were so nice. And then you get to a point where it's like, okay, there's a lot of fucking mean people in the world, but it's all right. Um, as far as good that I didn't expect, I mean, people are going to have opinions on me saying this, but I'll be totally honest. I did not know how much money was in it. Uh, that was something that was a huge what the fuck when it happened. Like, I literally couldn't believe it. And I think it was just because I, when I first started, when I was you know, doing things and I would take a photo for $500 on Instagram or when I was signed to Cherokee for 500 a month, that was a lot of money when I was only making like, what, how much is I making as a nurse? Like 60K a year. So $500 is a lot for one Instagram picture, especially comparing it to the amount of work. So I'm working for 12 and a half to 14 hour shifts in the hospital. Like this is morbid to say, but dead bodies in body bags and carrying them down to the morgue and I was making $60,000 a year and seeing a lot of horrible tragic things in the world and then I'm getting $500 to take a photo on Instagram I was like holy fuck so then when I got to the point I'm at now and I signed with like a team and they negotiate my rates and stuff I literally remember signing with my team and I said I'm sorry what the fuck did you just say that I am supposed to get for a TikTok or an Instagram post It's wild. It's bonkers. And I will never lie about it being bonkers. It is completely unrelatable. And any influencer that's trying to be relatable, they are making the same amount of money. So don't let them fool you by trying to be relatable. All influencers make an insane amount of money. It is an extension of marketing. And if you think about it, we don't even have cable TV. We we haven't had cable TV in like probably eight years. But people pay a lot of money to get commercials on cable TV, right? or for Instagram ads or TikTok ads. So when they're paying influencers that have millions of followers and a huge audience to promote their product, they're paying them way less than they would for a TV commercial or a spread in a magazine that people don't read anymore. So they're going to pay the influencer because we do have influence. That's our job, right? Is to influence people. And I feel so lucky that I'm at the point where I'm able to make that money, so I'm able to say no to the majority of ads offered my way. Scott can attest to that. I've gotten some insane deals offered to me, like crazy money, just enough money for one brand deal to buy a house in cash. That's fucking crazy. It was the biggest brand deal I was ever offered this last week, and I said no. Yeah, it was a shit ton of money, but I'm never going to promote a brand that I don't ever use. Like I've never used that product. I'm never going to promote it because I don't care how much money you can pay me. My audience is going to know that that's not authentic. They're going to be like, you've never used that product in your life. My team said no to the brand and they came back and said, name your price. How much money would it take for you to say yes? And I still said no. But that to me is then a reflection of the brand because you don't even care about my authenticity or that my audience will know it's not authentic. You just want to pay me money to talk about it. I'm not going to work with you. And it's not worth it for me to get the money when I know I'm not being true to myself or the people that support my family. So that was the biggest shock. And obviously it's an incredible thing. 
it's a good thing, but I think it was just a shock to me because of the career that I went to college for and worked so hard for and that amount of money I was making and my husband being a first responder and the amount of money he was making and then I was getting these brand deals and I'm like, what the fuck? That's crazy. So that was the biggest shock, to be totally honest with you. Oh, this is a controversial one. Your religious views. So I'm not religious. I've never been religious, actually. I was not raised in a religious household. My parents were both born and raised Catholic, and they chose not to stay part of that religion uh, when they became adults. And so they didn't raise us with anything, but they did tell us very early on, you guys are free to explore whatever religion, and we will support you. If you guys want to be part of religion, we have no issue with that. But my sister and I just never really found anything that we were interested in. I went to church with a lot of my friends, um, like non-denominational churches and stuff. Nothing just really ever resonated with me. My boyfriend in high school was very, very Catholic. And so I went to mass with him. And I just didn't like that. I felt like kind of thrown aside and abandoned like trash because I wasn't baptized. So I like couldn't have the offering or whatever the fuck it is. And I was just like, so I can't have your bread and water because you didn't put holy water on me. Like, okay, I'm hungry. I need a snack. (laughs) All jokes aside though, and I'm not making fun of religion in any way, shape or form. That's just how I viewed it when I was in high school. It's kind of like, okay, so I'm the loser, like the one standing off to the side. I just don't like how judgmental religions can be. I don't like that they aren't accepting of things that I am, like being gay or sexism, um, expectations for women. Uh, The more children you have, the like higher in heaven you go. I don't believe in that. I just think that's a tragic thing to say to a woman what if she can't have children? Like, you know what I'm saying? I just think, here's my thing too. I, I think I, and I have so many friends that are extremely, extremely religious. LDS. One of my closest friends is very Mormon. And we have conversations about this all the time. I will never judge her. I love that she's happy in the church. I love that her family has been a part of the church her whole life. And she raises her son in the church. I will never judge that. I just think I have seen so much tragedy in the world and David and I have both said this because David was raised super religious. I think you just get to a point where you kind of question what's real and what's not because first of all, I don't understand why there's so many different religions and so many different views why is it not all the same? That makes me question in general because I'm like, okay, well, who's right, right? I'm not saying I don't believe in God or a higher being. I think there, there's things that I've seen like miracles where I always am like, there has to be some sort of higher being, right? I also believe in UFOs. I, I think that there has to be something else outside of this universe. I think that who are we to say that it was in God's plan for a newborn to die of cancer or SIDS or drown or child abuse or be molested? Like those are not things that I think are in God's plan. I don't think that that's, and and then if, if it is, why is he allowing it to happen? That's what, that's, what's hard for me to understand but there would never be a person on this earth that could tell me, oh, it was God's plan for that child to die that way. I don't believe that. I don't believe. I think babies are the purest beings on this earth. I also don't believe that a baby's born into sin and needs to be baptized to be pure. I do not believe in that. I think that's ridiculous. Um, but David and I have tried. We've tried to go to non-denominational churches and build community for our family. And the first thing that they do is they introduce the pastor to us and they ask us about money. And that also makes me mad. Why do I need to pay you money to have some sort of sense of community or belief system? That's, no, that's crazy. Just for your pastors to make millions of dollars that are tax-free? Not you're fucking crazy, bro. So 
That's my thought on my profound religious views. I know that people will have opinions on that, but listen, I'm speaking truthfully and I'm saying I support anyone that's religious and I'm glad that those people have an outlet and a community for themselves. I don't know if I believe in a God, but I do believe in some sort of higher being or that there's something outside of humanity, if that makes sense. Okay, last question. This is getting kind of long. Sorry. The behind the scenes of an influencer lifestyle. So actually, Scott, you come answer this. I want to see what you have to say about like me behind the scenes. Come here. Come here. Don't be shy. I feel like as an influencer myself, like talking about myself, I could be like, well, you know, like this is what I do, like make it sound. But I feel like from an outside perspective, it'd be better. Just like you behind the scenes as an influencer? Yeah. Or like what my day to day looks like as an influencer. Oh, day to day? Yeah. Good Lord. So obviously because I work for you, I do see you almost every single day. Yeah. So I know what efforts go in behind the scenes. But I would say a day to day looks like you wake up and go to Pilates <laughs> and that's when work starts for you. You're constantly go, go, go. When it comes to filming, when you're with your kids, you're with the kids, you're present. Any ounce of free time that's personal for you is editing, filming, meetings, and any other time basically is just with your kids and family. So I feel like a regular day-to-day would be wake up, do Pilates, come home, clean up the house and film a few ads, do fun stuff with the kids, film more, meetings, put the kids to bed, and edit for a shit long time. Yeah, I know. Basically. Last night on the couch editing. Like... Any free time that you have, if it's not spent with your kids, yeah, it's getting ready for the next day. Even like getting ready for yeah. Ads and oh, and also work. don't forget school, pick up and drop off if oh, David's God. not able to. Thank get, God getting you the kids up and ready for you, school. But Jesus Christ, yeah, she does a lot. Also, um, I. Oh, what was I gonna say? Oh yeah, getting ready. Like unfortunately, I would be make it free the majority of my life to be honest with you i only put on makeup if i'm like gonna film an ad or something uh or we're doing something cute like date night but to be honest i work a lot and i'm trying to find balance in that because it does get like you burn out but i also love it so much and i would never complain that i'm burnt out because this is my job like it's crazy that is one thing i will say i've never seen you complain about oh i have to film this oh because you are very grateful for your yeah because i just know what life could be right and it's this is i'm my plan is we want to start businesses here soon and I'm so grateful that I'm able to do that and self-fund it from my job on social media. And also I want to give my audience, you know, quality products that I can share with them that I believe in because I have this platform. So those are kind of, that's also kind of like happening and then, you know, doing shit on the house and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, but today's Memorial Day and on Memorial Day we get drunk. So with that being said... That wraps up this episode. That was 71 minutes of recording. Holy shit. Sorry about that, guys. But I love you so much. We are currently in Kauai. I'm not in Kauai right now, but I'm leaving in four days and haven't packed a lick. So we need to do that. We're going to go to Ashley and Jesse's. We're going to go get drunk by the pool and hang out on Memorial Day. And then we're going to go on the boat tomorrow. And I don't know why I'm still talking. But anyways, I love you. I'll see you next Monday. Cheers. That's all. (laughs)